Hello everyone, you're listening to The Real Med White, David, The Real Med White, and this is part three of our video series refuting the Oriental Orthodoxy. Now, if you haven't checked the previous videos, I would recommend you check them out. And yeah, so let's let's start. Let's start. What are we talking about today? Well, we are talking about diaphysitism from the Church Fathers. So we are kind of moving away uh, from Saint Cyril and going past Saint Cyril and looking into other Church Fathers using this formula that was disputed to be a heretical innovation. Indeed. So one of the chief anti calcadonian arguments against Chalcedon is that this into nature's formula is novel. It's a novelty. It's a new f propped up formula that is not evident, that is not seen in the Church Fathers. Nothing could be further from the tr truth. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to do a book review of Leontes of Jerusalem's Against the Monophysites. This, this book is very, very, very important. Um, there are some couple wrong things in the book i will say a couple things that will cause suspicion one of them is that leontes of jerusalem is a poor textual scholar you could say um, he's not really that good at his job a lot of the documents that he's quoting it's either misquoted or some of them are straight up forgeries now whether he knew that they were forgeries or he didn't know they were forgeries is up to debate most people think that he didn't really know the documents he was working with were forgeries. But, thankfully, the translation of Patrick Gray allows us to know which document is actually, actually authentic and which documents are not authentic. So, we can move past beyond that scholarship debate and we can go to the real material. So, I will deliberately avoid using... Uh, these false documents and if you think that I'm making this stuff up I'm not gonna say you can go read the book for yourself although I will recommend you do that I will list the sources next to the page I will list the sources so you can go check them out for yourself so we're open about our sources I will be listing numerous sources from this book so that's one problem that we're going to be dealing with uh, this book deals with monophysitism, meaning that actually a lot of the arguments go between Eutychianism and Severinism. So these are two different monophysitic groups that consider each other heretical. Um, Eutychianism believes that Christ's human essence and divine essence mixed and became a Christic essence. For Severance, that's a heresy. And, you know, for their credit, that's a heresy. On the surface, they reject Eutychianism. But... If you're talking historically, like speaking historically, um, they used to be on the same team in rejecting Chalcedon. And as a matter of fact, a lot of Eutychians misinterpreted Saint Kirill into thinking that he believed that Christ had one Christic essence, and Severus kind of uh, corrected them. And this is evident from the letters of Severus of Antioch, where he corrects a lot of the Eutychians, and he says the nature here does not refer to essence; it refers to hypostasis, right? We're going to be moving more into detail in part 4 in the next video that's going to be uploaded tomorrow. And if you're watching this in any day other than the day of this video being uploaded, you can check out part 4 right now. Um, so let's begin. And oh, before I begin, uh, there's kind of like a dispute between who the real Leontius is. Generally speaking, what's accepted is that there are two Leontiuses. So there's Leontius of Jerusalem and there's Leontius of Byzantium and... They are contemporaries, although some people claim they aren't really contemporaries. General consensus is that they are contemporaries. <clears throat> and Leontius of Jerusalem is, again, very important. He's a very important character. He is very influential in our Christology in the Fifth Ecumenical Council for a very good reason, and we will be seeing why. So this is Leontius of Jerusalem, who is distinct from Leontius of Byzantium, again. So... Let's give a brief summary of what this book is about. Uh, this deals with a couple objections from anti calcedonians No fathers use the into nature's formula. So <clears throat> the book, The Testimonies of the Saints, is going to refute that exactly. It's going to be dealing with that question and we will be doing an in-depth review of that book. And anti calcedonians as a response, quote St. Kirill's Mia Fizite, statements but what Leontes of Jerusalem does and it's very important and 
if you've heard from several people claiming that I'm an ecumenist because I say metaphysicism is in in the Kirillian sense is completely acceptable, that's because it is acceptable. And as a matter of fact, if you look at the Antis of Jerusalem, he says, if you say you yourselves who suppose the masters out of two natures and in two natures, what sort of nat natures do you call them? We give them the following wholehearted answer. We say he's out of two natures, out of two natures meaning Miaphysis. The divine nature and the universal human nature, both of which pre-existed Christ's union, but we also say that he is in two natures. So further down on this video, we're going to be understanding how these two formulas work consistently with one another. And this is, there's two books that we're going to be dealing with in, in, the, in one book against the Monophysites. There's a book, uh, <coughs> Testimonies of the Saints. Another book is Aporai, Aporie, Aporai, however you want to spell it, I can't spell it, which deals with, which has, I believe, 63, um, there's 63 different arguments Leontius gives against the Monophysite position. So he deals with both Eutychianism and Severinism and he refutes those two positions. So we're going to be looking at these two books. So let's start <clears throat> with Testimonies of the Saints. Uh, what I will introduce with is Aporiate 62. He says, if they speak of the introduction of new terms because the fathers haven't spoken of two natures in Christ in so many words, either they must point out some father who speaks unequivocally of one nature or else they themselves are going to have to refrain from harshly using that kind of expression whenever we too, for our part, hear the most eminent of the teachers speaking of natures, but two natures. So what he's basically saying, if you haven't understood, is... A claim that anti calcanonians use is, again, Miaphysis is a patristic statement. That's actually the first argument. Like, they don't use that argument today for a very good reason. Some people do. But back then, at the eve of the Council of Calcanon, a lot of the arguments really hinged on, look, Miaphysis is from St. Athanasius, and it's from St. Kirill. And we don't see it in two natures other than from Nestorius, you see. So, really... This is an anti-patristic formula. <clears throat> and the answer is basically saying, if you want to apply that standard to us, you have to apply that standard for yourselves and find us fathers that speak of me a physis just like you claim they do. Now, what's really interesting, I'm not going to read the whole thing. This is a very long um, section. What's really interesting is that Leontius starts this book with word concept fallacy. And I'm not kidding. He starts with arguing against word concept fallacy. And this is very evident. Uh, so this is not a new thing that we propped up and we came up with. Oh, you you make you say uh, you commit the word concept. This is not something to be propped up. I mean, this is something the fathers had to deal with for centuries, centuries prior to this. Here you have Leonce of Jerusalem, one of the most important uh, Christologians. Here he is saying that a lot of people make the mistake of word concept fallacy. When he's saying uh, that because we support Diophysitism means that we go contrary against St. Kirill's Miaphysitism, and he deals with these arguments, right? So this is very important to understand. <clears throat> and then he really explicates here. So, for example, he makes notes, he makes a note of how St. Athanasius um, speaks of a union of persons. Right, the great Athanasius confidently affirms the union of persons in Christ and Proclus one of hypostasis. And the blessed Kirill said, if anyone devised the hypostasis. And so he's saying, if you try to make try to read the literal, the hyper literal expressions instead of trying to go behind the words and understand the concepts behind those words, then you're committing the word concept fallacy, then you should be Nestorians, really. Um, so this isn't really like a big argument on its own. I'm just pointing this out as an understanding of where these people come from, where word concept fallacy comes from, how it's really important. Because a lot of argumentation about these issues comes from, really stems from, uh, you have to say the magic words. I, I heard this argument, stupidest argument I've ever heard in my life. Someone said, Calcadon doesn't, the Council of Calcadon is against hypostatic union. Because the Council of Chalcedon doesn't use the word hypostatic union. Really? Really? You're going to use that argument? I mean, that's like a Muslim saying that the that, that Trinitarianism is not Christian 
because the Bible doesn't use the word Trinity. I mean, what nonsense is this? This is absolute nonsense. <laughs> this is absolute nonsense. We have to go behind the concepts. We have to go for the concepts that is behind those words. This is where a lot of misunderstandings stem from. So let's begin with the book Testimonies of the Saints. And let's begin our quote minds or quote mining operation. Some people might say, oh, you're hypocritical because you're quote mining. And actually, Antis of Jerusalem deals with this. You know, he says some people might say we are quote miners, that we are, uh, that we just pick statements that we like and ignore the statements we don't like. No, actually, that's not what we're doing. We're making this florilegium, and florilegium is, florilegiums are actually pretty good in some cases. And in this case, it's very important because, again, we're dealing with the argument that into natures is anti patristic. And what we're trying to prove here is Chalcedon is really continuing the patristic tradition of formulating Christ's two natures. Right. So, what is Christ whom we are to adore? Um, as you can see, the one on the left is the Greek writing. So, there's the Greek translation. So, there's like two pages. You know, when you open two pages in a book, the left page is Greek in this book, and the page on the right is an English translation, and the, and the page on the left also has the sources and the citations. So it should be easy to follow. It should be too difficult to follow. So for example, Athanasius' quote is from Pseudo-Athanasius. So we don't follow that, right? And St. Vasil says uh, what Christ is, is divinity making use of animated flesh, right? But what we want to focus on is St. Gregor of Nazianzus, who says, A new mixture, God and man, one out of both, and both true one, both true one, both in one. Right? Synonymous. It's also important, again, a new mixture. Now, we don't believe that the nature is mixed, but St. Gregor of Nazianzus does speak of mixture. Um, again, this is to highlight the word concept fallacy, but also let's understand, he says that the natures of Christ, he's out of both, and the both is true one. So out of both natures and in both natures? Exactly. Exactly what we say, right? So these are from St. Kirill. Um, there are two quotations. There's one quotation here and another quotation I added from the letters of St. Kirill of Alexandria. So St. Kirill says from Glafira, and the quotation is there. It's Glafira on the Pentateuch 4. He says he... In, in his in his commentary of Genesis, he orders two small living clean birds to be taken, and he moves on to say, so that you might understand from winged creatures the man from heaven, at once man and God, into natures, inasmuch as he came to be in the separate definition that belongs to each. He who shone forth from God the Father was word in flesh from a woman. So we see an into natures formula from Saint Kirill of Alexandria, and another addition I would like to make is letter fifty three to Pope Sixtus. He says, "I know that I know that the nature of the word, uh, I know that the nature of God is impassable, unchangeable, and immutable. Even though by the nature of his humanity, Christ is one in both natures, and from both natures. So again, exactly what we say is from Saint Kirill. Now, of course, a lot of anti calcan ap apologists might scream and shout, "Oh, Leontius of Byzantium made up this quote. Oh, these quotes are made up. They're lies. They're made up." Okay, let's assume that. Let's assume that and move on. Is every single quote that we are about to see forgeries? Probably not. So once more, the Cappadocian Fathers, St. Gregory of Nazianz, the theologian, says the combination is one, however, it is not one by nature. So it's not one by nature. What does he mean by nature here? Does he mean by hypostasis? No, he means by essence, because nature is synonymous with essence for St. Gregory of Nazianz and for Chalcedon. It's one not by nature, but by union. Right, <clears throat> Saint Kirill says, after the union, we of course do not separate the natures from each other, nor do we sever the one and undivided Christ into two sons. And so Leontius says that he recognizes natures that they are undivided after the union, and not that they are one nature, in 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 the sense of Chalcedon. Saint Gregory of Nyssa, from against the Uno against Eunomius, the human nature does not bring Lazarus to life. Does that remind you of something? Po the tome of Leo. Who speaks of forms nor does the impassable power weep over him who lies dead and further on the mediator between god and man as the divine apostle styles him is nothing like what the name of son signifies for it is adapted to each nature each nature the divine and the human as is appropriate exactly what 
the Tomb of Leo says years later what St. Gregory of Nyssa says. Furthermore, St. Gregory of Nyssa, to Philip the Monk on the opposition of Arians, he says, Wickedness is what is begun by a soul. What I am saying when I use the word unconfused is that even though the things combined are one in an inexpressible and ineffable union, uh oh, he doesn't use the word hypostatic union, so he's not talking about hypostatic union, right? I mean, Again, this, this word concept fallacy is so stupid. We have to make note of this every single time. They're not one by nature. For the divine is different from the body, being alien to it. This means that the Christ who exists as two natures and is truly recognized in them is a single person at the same time unconfused. Exactly. <clears throat> now this is very important because now we are diving into St. Isidore of Pelusium who is a contemporary and he's a Coptic saint too. And look what he says to St. Kirill of Alexandria. This is letter 323, 323. You yourself will not deny that the true God over all became a man, not changing what he was, yet taking on what he was not, one existing son in two natures, immutable and unchangeable, both new and eternal, since you have an exceedingly large number of proofs concerning these issues from our Holy Father, the great Athanasius. So notice, <laughs> again, he says to St. Kirill that he will not deny that Christ is in two natures. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Paul, Bishop of Emesa. I'm not going to read the entire things here. That will be too long. He says, We drew water to us. Consider John when he proclaims two natures and one son. One a tent and the other the one who dwells in that tent. One a temple and the other the indwelling God. Pay attention to what is said. He did not say one person and another as of two persons or Christ or as of two sons, but one thing and another as of two natures. Exactly. Uh, so St. Kiel from the letter to John of Antioch. This is a very popular letter and the Holy Synod held under him in which he says the latter's writings are received. Since they're correct, we recognize that theologians hold some evangelical and apostolic texts about the Lord to be common as concerning one person, but distinguish others of them as concerning two natures. So exactly, we point this out a lot, and many times in our disputations. This proves very true. St. Kirill approves of what St. Uh, Leo is doing in his tome. And to object to that is obje really objecting against St. Kirill of Alexandria. A text of St. Ambrose. So now we are moving on to the Western Fathers. And what we are going to be proving is that the Western Fathers and the Eastern Fathers on this issue on the natures of Christ speak in unison. Let us preserve the difference between the divinity and the flesh. The Son of God speaks in each of them, for each nature is in Him. Each nature is in Him. Not out of Him, but in Him. Very important. This is from On the Faith to Gratian. St. Kirill from the letter On the Incarnation. Uh, Scholy on the Incarnation. One must not divide the one Lord and Son and Christ independently into a man and a God, what we say rather is that there is one and the same Christ and Son while recognizing the difference of natures and while keeping them from being confused with each other. And then he says, what is perfectly understood is that one thing is in another, the divine nature is in humanity. The same from the interpretation of the epistle to the Hebrews, each rather being understood and existing in the definition of its own nature, that the union has been effected. And again, we do not say that any confusion of the natures with each other has been effected, but rather since each instead remains precisely what it is, we understood that the word has been united with the flesh. So exactly the same things that we say. Uh, the same from the third book against Nestorius. Therefore, it is inasmuch as the only begotten has become present to our understanding and became man in some way perceptible only to the eyes of the soul that we say there are two natures. Exactly what Chalcedon says. So if you look at my previous video, you will say that the Council of Chalcedon says the exact same thing what St. Kirill says that according to the eyes of the soul, we perceive two natures in Christ. But we reality see one Christ and Son and Lord because Christ is enhypostatized, right? The natures of Christ are enhypostatized, meaning that the essences, the two essences that Christ possesses exist in the mode of a single hypostasis, meaning a single person. This is what St. Kirill is telling the story is. But this theology is lost in Oriental theology. So here we have a couple of very important statements. Uh, some of these letters are not really attested. Uh, 
but so we will read the first half of the part because the letters are not attested however um, let us read the same from the letter to Iphlogius from St. Kirill of Alexandria saying that what he rejects is not the use of the word two but the refusal of, to speak of two natures united by hypostasis and he says it is the same in the case of Nestorius even if he speaks of two natures signifying the difference between the flesh and God the word for God the word's nature is one and the flesh nature is another so there's the difference between these, these two natures. Now, keep this in mind. Severus of Antioch actually does believe in the same thing. He actually says that there's a difference between the natures after the union as well. But let's move on. This, this is very important. All the same, he does not confess the union along with us. The same from the letter to John. There is one Lord Jesus Christ, though the difference between the nature is not to be ignored. And so, so the answer is asked, is this difference then between existent things or are they non-existent? So St. Gregor of Nyssa against Apollinarius, if then the nature of each of these is to be observed in their opposite properties, I am referring to the properties of flesh and of divinity, how can the two natures be one? Now this is very interesting because Apollinarius also said Mia Physis uh, before St. Kirill of Alexandria. Keep this in mind, we will come back to that a bit later. And then St. Kirill of Alexandria from the treasuries saying that since substances exist, there must exist differences in substance. Therefore, since the substance is already in existence, the differences are brought to, uh, to the mind. And so this is what we understand when we say the Christ is into nature according to the intellect. We understand the difference they're brought to the mind. Now, some people might ask, why are they brought to the mind? Why can't you just say that there are differences? Well, if you speak of a radical difference, that kind of implies that these two substances exist not in the mode of a person, but in the mode of two distinct persons. So that's kind of the implication of that. And that's why we see, say that the distinction comes to our mind. Uh, because if we speak of a distinction in reality, there is a distinction in reality per se. You could speak of that in some way. But if you say there is a distinction in reality, you're distinguishing them, those two natures and creating two persons between those two natures. So this is a very, it is to contain theological precision is why we say these things. And again, if you watch my previous video, you will see in the Chalcedonian definition that this is exactly what Chalcedon says, not what um, anti chalcedonians want it to be saying. And so finally, St. Isidore of Pelusium, guard your heart with all care, therefore lest you accept at any time one nature of Christ after the incarnation. Again, and, and the rest of the statements here are, other than from Peter of Alexandria, is, are not attested, so I will not cite them. St. Ambrose, so they, these are quotations from St. Ambrose now. The same from his address to the crowds, whoever makes one nature out of two introduces complete mixture and confusion. So wait a second, is St. Ambrose anatomizing St. Kirill? Obviously not, but if you're anti chalcedonians we will say that and we will call St. Ambrose a heretic <laughs> if you were logically consistent uh, as anti chalcedonians of course. We are logically consistent as Chalcedonians. We confess two natures in Christ united by an ineffable union. So he's referring to the essences and in no way separated from or confused with each other since clearly the property appropriate to each is recognized and preserved. Though we know one Christ, the only begotten Son, for the two together made one Christ for our sake and not one nature. So he's distinguishing personhood, hypostasis, with nature. So for him, nature means essence, exactly. And this is always what has meant for most of the people. Not for Alexandrians, it seems like. Uh, the same from, from St. Ambrose, uh, from his interpretation of the holy symbol, for Christ is destroyed in my substance, which he assumed, and in the divine substance raise, raises up his destroyed temple. Now you might say, oh wait, these are not also attested. Okay, let's assume that they are not real quotations. Well, let's look at St. Ambrose on the Incarnation. Uh, yeah, so there's a mistake here by Leontius. This is one of the main mistakes that he makes is that, um, so he quotes... St. Ambrose, he says it's from against Apollinarius, but actually it's from On the Incarnation. 
Because Christ is the Son of God in eternity from the Father and is also born from a virgin whom Holy David the prophet described as being like a giant because he alone is in two forms and is double in nature because he shares in divinity and humanity. So he alone is in two forms. Again, the tome of Leo, who's speaking of forms. If the tome of Leo is heretical because he speaks of forms, then St. Ambrose is also heretical. So you also need to anatomize St. Ambrose, obviously. The same from the work against Antonius the bishop. Now let me make sure. Yes, letter 46. So that he might achieve completeness in each nature. The same from against Gratian. Let me make sure that this is again an authentic. Uh, one son of God speaks in each nature. In each nature. Uh, seeing that each nature is in him. Amphilochius of Iconium says, distinguish the natures, the nature of God and the nature of man. The same from the letter to Seleucus, one son belonging to two natures, one passable, the other uh, the other impassable. And after a bit, he, he says, Christ, the son of God, the, son, the one son belonging to two complete natures. And after a few things, he goes on to say, I speak of one son of God belonging to two natures. And after a few things, God the Word himself makes the things that pertain to the temple his own without suffering at all since the two natures belong to one person. So this is from Amphilochius of Iconium, which is attested in Theodore of Cyrus's Erinistus. So these are not fake quotations made up out of our mind. So let's look at St. Augustine. St. Augustine says, Thus there appeared at this time a mediator between God and man, so that he might bind together each nature in the unity of person, and after a bit, recognize the twofold nature of Christ. I am referring to the divine nature that is the equal of the Father, and to the human nature than which the Father is greater. Saint Flavian of Antioch, which is attested in John Maron, from the commentary on John concerning the text, He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father, so that we may teach both of his natures. The same on the ascension of the Lord. He says, Divinity is united with a human nature, though each nature remain, remains by itself. So again, the principles of into natures still present. And you can say that Severus says the same thing. Uh, let's, see, let's see. Isidore. Saint Isidore of Pelusium. Again, from his letter to Theodosius, the deacon, this is letter 405. Christ became become man is not a mere man, but God, one son, exists uh, out of two natures. Oh, sorry, sorry, I didn't read that correctly. One son exists in both of the natures. And this guy, again, this guy is a Coptic saint. But here he is saying that Christ is into natures. And he's a contemporary of St. Kirill of Alexandria. Did you know that? <laughs> But, oh no, St. Isidore of Pelusium, he's, um, he's an historian, but he can be saint because he's a holy person. I mean, is that what you're going to say? Oh, that's, that's ludicrous. St. Kirill, from the work in dialect form, that Christ is one, had a two natures that be commingled and become one nature, who will be so stupid and ignorant? So he's refuting the Eutychian position here, not really the Severan position. Um, and I believe that will be it for this page. Yep. So now... We are starting to get to Severus of Antioch and what he thinks of these statements, what he thinks of these quotations. So in his Against the Grammarian, third letter against the Grammarian, he says, Even if saying that Christ existed into nature's undivided after the union was something asserted by certain teachers of the church in times gone by. So he's saying, let's pretend, which it is, it, it is the case, but let's pretend that into natures has been said by the Holy Fathers and even by Saint Kirill. So he admits that Saint Kirill might have even said these things. He says he gave it up afterwards. So he admits that Saint Kirill says into natures, but then he says he gave it up afterwards. Just as he gave up saying Christ suffered in the nature of humanity, though that was said in a correct way by the Orthodox. Okay. When he took a stand against those who caught the disease of dividing, Thus, no kind of defense was handed to those who gathered at Chalcedon when they determined that Christ was made known in two natures that are undivided. Now, this is very questionable. So the fathers, 
the holy fathers say into natures, but when Kalkadon says it, it's wrong. Why exactly is this wrong? We will see later on. Why is this exactly wrong? So this is the Antis of Jerusalem. I'm not going to read the entire thing. This is pretty long. But what I want to read you out is that he points out that the Miaphysis formula was used first by Arians and then by Apollinarians and other heretics that used the term one incarnate nature of the word. So there's an attestation from the Antis of Jerusalem that Yes, indeed, it was the Arians first that used this term. And this is very important to keep in mind as well. So this completely refutes the notion that Miaphysis is a patristic term, which again, isn't a problem for us. Again, this is not a problem for us. This, isn't, this doesn't defeat our arguments, but it begs the question, you know, let's say that Miaphysis is the... Miaphysis, the Miaphysis formula is the completeness of Christology, that it completes the Christology, uh, the Orthodox Christology. Okay, so until uh, Miaphysis came by Arians and Apollinarians, like no one had accurate Christology? Give me a break. That's nonsense. That's stupidity. That's absolute stupidity. That's nonsense. But as, but if you, if you were anti calcadonians that's what our arguments lead to, right? So now, now these are the big guns. These are the big guns, people. This Leon of Jerusalem, we have noted, is a very poor textual scholar. However, when he's trying to argue, he, he can actually be a very good textual scholar when he really wants to. And in this case, we see where he really shines. He will provide certain quotations and prove to us that these quotations that were used by anti calcadonians have you heard that? They were quotations used by anti calcadonians all the time. And Leon of Jerusalem proves that these quotations, supposedly from the fathers, were actually forgeries. They were forgeries from Apollinarius. So it's kind of like on the level of pseudo Isidor decretals or the donation of Constantine, not on like that level but it's principally the same thing what happened here so in here supposedly saint athanasius says this we confess that he is both son of god and god in spirit but son of man in flesh we don't confess that the one son is two natures one that's to be worshipped and another that's not to be worshipped but one incarnate nature of god the word worshipped along with his flesh in one act of worship so what is this from this is from ad jovian but this is an Apollinarian forgery. And we will see very importantly, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but there's a very important thing that we have to check out. So follow with me. A certain Timothy, a disciple of Apollinarius, affirms in his church history that these things were said by Apollinarius in the sense intended by you, you referring to the severance, and so does his companion Polemon, whom both the father Kirill and the patricidal Severus mention. So this is from Timothy, Ecclesiastical History, right? And here is what he says. This is a, this is a bombshell. This is a huge bombshell. Those who say the same, that the same Christ is both God and man aren't ashamed of confessing one incarnate nature of God the Word as being some sort of compound Christ. That is to say, if the same Christ is complete God and complete man, then he is two natures. Just what the Cappadocian's innovation introduces. Cappadocian's innovation. So for him, Cappadocian's, the Cappadocian father, Saint Vasil, Saint Gregory of Nyssa, these people, Saint Gregory the Theologian, for Timothy, who according to Apollonius, who, who says that Miaphysis is a response to Diophysis, and Diophysis is an innovation by the Cappadocian fathers. So he's admitting that the Cappadocians are Diophysites. Exactly. So thank you, Timothy the Apollinarian, for proving our point. So we have more quotations here from Pseudo-Athanasius. I'm not going to read all of these things, but you can look at the sources on, on the left. These are Apollinarian um, quotations used by 
Apple Nears. All of these are basically Saint Athanasius, supposedly, or Julius, Bishop of Rome, supposedly saying that Christ is uh, one incarnate nature. Again, these are all made up. These are all forged, made up documents. And Leon of Jerusalem proves this in his book. More of this, as we can see here, you can pause the video, you can read, you can check the sources for yourself, you can look at the research for yourself, you can do anything you want. But what's really funny is that they're making the same exact arguments Severance used against Chalcedon. Isn't that funny? <laughs> they're arguing against the Cappadocians the same way Severus is arguing against Chalcedonians. Doesn't that mean, doesn't that kind of imply that Chalcedon is following the Cappadocian fathers? Exactly. That's what it implies. So, let us see. Uh, this is more, yeah, this is more more from Apollinarius. This is all Apollinarius pretending to be church fathers and introducing, like, a, a formula. And this explains how St. Kirill uh, insists on Mia Physis as a formula. And this, is, this also is why a lot of people in Antioch and Patriarchate at the time, taught that St. Kirill was an Apollinarian because years ago, they saw the, the same arguments from Apollinarius. And now they saw St. Kirill use these arguments. And it took St. Kirill explaining himself and explaining the chapters and explaining his theology. That's when the Antiochians and, and a lot of the a lot of the bishops understood, oh, he's actually not Apollinarian. He's just... He just has a very weird terminology, right? And that's how they understood the St. Kirill is actually not being heretical. But that explains it, right? That explains it. Why will they think that he's Apollinarian? Because he uses Mia Physis. Is it because Apollinarius uses it? I mean, that's, doesn't that logically follow? Of course it logically follows. So that kind of ends the testimonies of the saints. We have various different statements from the church fathers about how Christ is into natures. Epore, Eporiae, whatever you want to call it, is going to be dealing with logical argumentation. So these are logical argumentations against Severance and against Eutychians. And mo a lot of the arguments are really basic. It's really dealing with um, Eutychians. So one basic argument is that, oh, you know, if you think Christ is compounded out of two essences, and there's one essence at the end of the union, then how can Christ be consubstantial with us and consubstantial with God? He can't be like half consubstantial and half consubstantial with other, right? That, that doesn't exist, right? Otherwise, are we co like 98% consubstantial with uh, bananas? That, that's nonsense, right? Just because we share the same DNA? No, we don't share consubstantiality. We share consubstantiality with other human beings because we're humans. We don't share any form of consubstantiality with wolves, with god with uh, any other creature or we don't share consubstantiality with insects right so that's one of the very basic arguments but we there are many really good arguments in Epore that i want to mention and i want to use these arguments i will be using in part four as well uh extensively but i want to give you guys a little bit of a sneak peek for what i will be talking about so let us begin with the set of arguments that Leontius brings. Now, this set of arguments, I'm not going to read the entire thing. I'm not really going to read. You can, if you want to, you can pause it and read it for yourself. But this argument basically is, if Christ is out of two natures and he is not confused, then how does a union out of two that is unconfused numerically becomes one? And this is this is not really an argument in and of, in and of itself that you can use. But what he's trying to do, he's trying to do two things. Number one, he's trying to basically say that out of two natures and into natures really say the same thing. They logically lead the same thing. But also he's trying to make a point about something that we will be talking about right now. And so this is his argument about distinction implying multiplicity, right? So he's basically saying here, if Christ is out of two natures, and those two natures are distinct after the union, doesn't that mean that there are two natures after the union? And this will give pause to people, and I will explicate further on in part four why this objection matters and why this is actually a very crucial objection. 
But what he's basically saying is that distinction implies multiplicity. So if you're going to try to say the Christ is in two na uh, out of two natures, then unless you try to say that they're confused and they're mixed, you can't really say that those two natures don't operate after the union as well. So another argument he uses, and this is a Kirillian argument, and it's an argument I used uh, a long time ago, is communicatio idiomatum. So he's basically saying, look, there's an exchange of properties of Christ's two natures after the union, but for there to be a communication of these two properties, there needs to be multiple properties naturally so there can't be one property is basically he's saying because is one property going to communicate a property to, to itself and of course not it presupposes that there is a multiplicity of distinct properties communicating things to each other right so the humanity communicates its properties to the divinity and if you don't really understand what that pertains i explained it in part one but i'll explain it again it means that what is attributed actions that Christ's humanity does is attributed to his divinity as well. So for example, we could say God suffered. Does that mean God suffered in his divine nature? That doesn't mean that. But it does mean that the divine person, the divine hypostasis, God suffered. Right? The member of the second trinity, uh, the second person of the trinity did indeed suffer. That is what Communicatio Idiomatum says. God walked. We could say God walked. Um, God ate. God was hungry. Uh, right, so we could we could say these things, but that doesn't attribute it to the divinity. So there's, these are exchange of properties. Now this apore is very interesting. It defends the tome of Saint Leo. So Saint Leo, if you watch the or defense of Chalcedon part two, if you've seen that, the uh, Pope Saint Leo says he asks. Observe what nature is on the cross. And I've used this defense and I'll use it again. This is from the answer of Jerusalem. And he basically says, if the divinity doesn't suffer, then doesn't that logically mean that uh that it's doesn't that doesn't that mean that Pope Saint Leo is actually right in saying that the human nature was on the cross in that manner? So he's, he's basically defending Pope St. Leo. And I will say this is a decent defense. This is a decent defense because, yes, it is the humanity that suffered. It doesn't mean that it's a different person. It's still God that suffered. It is a Theopascal formula. But what I also want to add is, is I will be linking this in the description. This is very interesting, okay? This is very interesting because I don't think this reflects standard Oriental theology. But it reflects... Uh, it reflects something really, really, really vital. So there's a there's a video dialogue between the Coptic Church and the Assyrian Church. So basically, Severin versus Nestorian <laughs> dialogue. And I will be putting this video in the description. I will I will prefer to play it so you can hear it for yourself. But I'll put it in the description. This was found by Johnny K KZ. Um, he's on YouTube, known as Orthodox True Apologetics. I forgot the exact name of his channel. But this is a very good object. This is a very good thing to point out, because the Coptic side says that the divine nature suffered too. Now he's not referring to communicatio idiomatum. He's actually making an argument that if the divine nature didn't suffer, then that will. If the divine nature didn't suffer, then what's the difference between putting Christ on the cross and putting a prophet on the cross? So that's his argument. And we will say communicatio edimatum, right? We will say an exchange of properties, but the Coptic side does not invoke that. He doesn't invoke this. He says the divine nature suffered. And again, I don't think this is the normative oriental teaching. I think that guy is a heretic, even in the oriental position by saying that. But I think this showcases that many oriental priests, many oriental apologists have no idea about what their teachings are. They have no idea about what their own fathers say. And I think this is something that we need to point out. So this is, again, a... Uh, he's once again focusing on uh, multiplicity in a union, remaining in its multiplicity after the union. And this will also... So, for example, if, the, if in a union the things united remain, if they don't remain, then they're either mixed, they're confused, or whatnot. 
And what he also says is, look, if Christ is out of two natures, he still remains two natures. And then he explains that this is exactly Nestorius' error. Right? This is why St. Kirill, this is the exact notion St. Kirill invoked in arguing that Nestorius was a heretic because Nestorius believed in a prosopic union. Prosopic union is a union of, uh, I've mentioned this in the part one of the video, it's a union of will, it's based on will. It's basically the union of God has with saints. But St. Kirill said, you can't say that in a prosopic union Christ is one because if he's out of two persons, Really, he is still two persons after the union, two distinct persons. He's exactly right. But we could use the same argument for the severance, and we can say if two natures, if there's two hypostases that is composed, then after the union, there has to be two hypostases. So actually, you also end up being kind of Nestorian in a way. But, as, but we will, again explicate on this we will be we'll be giving a defense of this we will steal man this, uh, the orto, the oriental position in the next part so that will that will pretty much end it uh, i will give you a summary of the whole debate i will recommend you check the book out i will recommend you um you could get it as pdf you could buy the book i believe but you could also get it as pdf online it's fairly easy if I want to read the book for yourself and see what's in there. So this section, this is the entire section of the summary of the debate of Anti-Chalcedonian and Leontius. So Anti-Chalcedonian says, and of course the sources are in the book as well. I haven't covered the entire book. Uh, I haven't covered entire arguments. My main focus was proving that the that the into nature's formula is patristic and that we see it both in the West and, on the, and in the East. And... What we see here is, let's let's look at the argument. The fathers say one incarnate nature, but you say two united natures of Christ. The answer's response: The fathers do in fact speak of two natures. Even Severus recognizes this. We accept both expressions as meaning the same thing. One incarnate nature of God, the Word, equals two natures united in one hypostasis. So as you can see, out of two physics and Diophysis, understanding the Orthodox sense are both accurate. They're both the same. And different ways of expressing things are both common and necessary. The meaning is what's important, not the particular words. Word concept fallacy. Right? Exactly. This is word for word, word concept fallacy that he's dealing with. anti calcadon response. One incarnate nature captured Christological truth exactly. Why add another expression? Leontius responds with each has its own use. Just as one incarnate nature was introduced as a way of expressing both the duality and the unity of Christ that could exclude Nestorianism's misuse of two natures, so two natures united in one hypostasis were brought, was brought in to express that duality and unity in a way that could exclude Eutychianism's misuse of one nature. Again, the point is what they mean underneath the form of words. You need to reject people who impute an incorrect meaning to either expression and accept those who impute a correct meaning. Number two, do not confuse two meanings of nature. Number three, Kirill himself intended by one incarnate nature exactly what correct thinking people intend by two natures united in one hypostasis. He was not inconsistent. Four, for Kirill to say that there is one incarnate nature of Christ does not necessarily mean that there is only one nature in the sense of substance. So he's responding to Eutychianism here. If so, both humanity and divinity will be replaced by some other nature. Kirill, however, was using nature in the sense of hypostasis, and in a hypostatic union, the natures united persist, but exist in a single entity. Now, you cannot any longer use confusion about the meaning of nature as an excuse for not rejoining us. So, what's the response? First, uh, oh, he, he moves on further on. This is the second. Uh, uh, first, brief florilegium shows that the fathers speak of natures in Christ that persist after the unions so against the testimonies, uh, the testimonies of the saints. A second long florilegium shows that the fathers speak of a union by hypostasis of two natures, whatever terms they use to refer to the union and the duality. A third florilegium shows that even anti calcedonians like Severus cannot help recognizing this kind of union and duality. anti calcedonian response, you pick only the patristic texts that suit your purposes. So you're quote mining, basically. You're quote mining. You're a quote mining heretic. And the response, the select fathers never disagree with themselves or with each other. 
whereas you claim to find them saying the opposite of what we found them to say. That is only because you're looking at the form of words they use rather than the underlying meaning, which is actually the same. Bring forward your evidence then and we shall show that we are right about this. Remember though, the terms were often used imprecisely by the fathers. Do not be confused by this. So what does he mean by imprecision? Well, as you see in the first part of the video, what did St. Gregory, the theologian, I believe? No, St. Gregory of Na One of the Cappadocian fathers start by saying that Christ's natures are mixed. Right, so that's an example of imprecision. The expression anti-Calcadonian answers, two natures that you use is an historian expression, but Kirill spoke of one nature. So this is kind of the argument that Severus uses. Uh, he says that, oh, you know, we have fathers that speak of two natures, but the two natures is no longer appropriate because, well, guess what? Because Nestorius used it, so now it's a corrupted term. He literally uses this argument. I'm not kidding. I believe he uses this in Philalitis, but don't quote me on that. You can check out Pauline Allen's book on Severus of Antioch. He uses that argument 100%. Um, but... It's the fact, as the answer is, the fact that Nestorius used the expression does not prove it is of itself erroneous. Exactly. Many pagan heretics used hypostasis. Does that mean we refuse to use hypostasis? I mean, this is so laugh. This is so stupid. This is a very stupid response. But people still use this response. When it comes to texts of Kirill that speak of one nature, however, it can be shown from what he says in the context that what he means by nature is person or hypostasis. Exactly. And to their credit, Severus also refers to nature as hypostasis. But his, his system is different. It's, it's, it's a different system that we will explicate on. When Kirill says Christ is out of two natures after the union and says he does not divide the natures after the union, he makes it clear from the context that he means that he does not divide the one son whose natures they are and that there are two natures there to be discerned by the eyes of the soul. Kirill's paradigm for union, the union of body and soul in man that produces one, means the production of one person hypostasis, not of one nature in the sense of substance. This is refuting the Eutychians. Either Kirill means one person and one hypostasis when he says one nature, or he is inconsistent. Texts claimed to be from Athanasius, Julius of Rome, Gregory Thaumaturgus that use one nature can be shown by historical investigation to be forgeries produced by Apollinarians, though Cyril cited them in good faith and as bearing an orthodox meaning. Yes, so St. Kirill does cite Apollinarian forgeries not knowing that they were forgeries, but Apollinarians themselves, again, Timothy, ecclesiastical history, they themselves admit that Apollinarius came up with, the, with this formula. For what? For what reason? Do you remember what reason it was? Uh, because it was to respond to the Cappadocian's innovation. What's the Cappadocian innovation? Diophysitism. Exactly. So exactly the same debate. Does that mean that the Oriental position is Apollinarian, by the way? Oh, it's not. It's 100% not. That's a, that's a straw man. Um, but I'm noting that they're using the same exact arguments. Um, the supposed falsehood of the Chalcedonian Church. So these are Leontius' arguments. I won't really be on board with all, all of these arguments. Um, but he says... Chalcedon pretended it meant to condemn Eutychius, but really it wants to preserve disguise in Stordianism. Leontius says, Chalcedon actually confirmed everything Kirill in the Council of Ephesus said and did against Nestorius. We agree here, and anathematized him and all who agreed with him. Agreed with him, him being Nestorius. And to Chalcedon, some participants in Chalcedon had been Nestorian sympathizers. Leontius response, two or three closet Nestorians could not taint the whole council which was established by divine providence to enunciate lasting doctrine. So he's he's taking the worst case scenario, like he's accepting the worst case scenario, and he's still nevertheless saying that Chalcedon is right. And Chalcedon says their, their error made the whole culpable. The answer says, if, if so, then those at Chalcedon who had been at Ephesus were culpable, and Ephesus was by the same token tainted by their culpability. Why not leave the few deceivers to the judgment of God and agree with us on the underlying signal meaning of both Christological expressions. So he's kind of dealing with the, the Neo-Donatist future fake Orthodox 
responses, really. Kalkadon replaced its first creed by a second, showing the instability of their beliefs. So he's referring to the first creed that contained the out of two natures formula, and they replaced it with the into natures formula. Leontes' response with all councils involved disagreement, even Nicaea. Obviously, so disagreement doesn't disprove the council. Anti Chalcedonian says the remaking of its creed demonstrated a profound change of opinion from what it is first believed. Well, the, the assumption here is that Miaphysis and Diophysis are two opposite formulas. Well, Leontius says Chalcedon remade its creed because it realized what it had first said needed to be corrected. Why did it need to be corrected? Because it was dealing with Eutychianism. How did Eutychianism came? Because Eutychius confused what out of two natures meant. He, he taught out of two natures meant that the natures were mixed after the union. Anticalcadon says, Calcadon really deposed Dioscorus because he attacked Nestorianism but misrepresented the reason for condemning him as being his refusal to appear and summoned. That is very strange. But Leontes response, he was summoned for receiving Eutychius and anatomat anatomat anatomatizing Flavian, Saint Flavian, but then he made false excuses for not appearing and eventually was deposed for refusing to appear three times. What does Saint Paul says? Uh, after the first two admonition and the third admonition, reject the heretic. Exactly. Leon anti Calcedonian says, why did Calcedon condemn him for refusing to appear rather than on doctrinal grounds? Leonti says Dioscorus was suspected for, of holding the Eutychian heresy, and that was the real reason why he was summoned. But he was condemned when he refused to appear. The doctrinal charge was not withdrawn or misrepresented. It simply never came to trial. And note that Dioscorus did receive Eutychus. And to Calcutta response, Dioscorus received Eutychus only when he renounced his error. If that is true, then Eutychus admitted he had been in error, in which case Dioscorus ought not to have condemned Flavian for deposing him. I will add, he should not have condemned Flavian without letting Flavian defend himself. So, double standards at play. Another case of double standards. Uh, oh, you accept Theodoret and Ibas. Well, you accepted Eutychius. So we can use the same argument for themselves, but they apply double standards here. anti in response, Flavian was tainted by Nestorian sympathies, though which taints everything he did against Eutychius. Eftichis, that's really the how it's said, but that will be too confusing. Leontius response, Flavin's own statements show that was not the case. You have assumed that our silence about Dioscorus' suspected Eutychianism meant Chalcedon deposed him unjustly. In fact, Chalcedon's decisions represented the careful deliberations of a great assembly. Compare that with Severus' arrogant unilateral condemnation of, this, that, of that same great assembly. Individuals do not anatomatize councils. It is the other way around. So he's, making, so he's noting that it's really the councils that should be judging other councils, not individuals judging councils. It's an interesting point, and I think it could be noted in ecclesiological disputes. <clears throat> Most votes at Chalcedon were the result of bribery. So here, Leontius takes the worst-case scenario approach and, and assumes that they are true. The council could have enunciated true doctrine all the same. You should be forgiven of the, sinners, uh, of the sinners involved, especially given the acceptance of money for performing sacraments by some of your clergy. Now, this is very interesting. So, such things did indeed happen. What's the proof of this? The, is there any anti calculating proof of this happening? Well, read Severus. Severus actually speak of, speaks of this in his letters. Um, he actually speaks of corruption going on in his church. And if you read the Pauline Allen book, Severus of Antioch, uh, there are various texts of Severus talking about it. So he actually affirms that this happens either way. So Leontes basically says, okay, let's let's anatomatize Chalcedon because uh, people sinned. Uh, and by the way, let's also anatomatize your position because you're priest sin. So again, this is kind of like a donatist position. Um, I will not be fully on board, but I think... There is a good point to be made by Leontius. He continues on to say, We urge everyone to treat theological statements objectively, as if they came from complete strangers rather than from friends or enemies. Judge where the truth is being clearly spoken, remembering that we shall be judged by Christ as his second coming. Loyalty to one's teacher 
and faction of solidarity will mean nothing in the in the in Christ's coming. And Calcedonian, now this is kind of where it becomes memeish, but he says, I have too much self-respect to change my opinion. The auntie says that is to be zealous without paying attention to what you're being zealous for. Exactly. And to calculate, the truth of what our people say is confirmed by God's gift of miracle working power to them. So notice, where have you heard this objection before? Fatima? Medjugorje? Marian apparitions? Have you noticed that the Roman Catholics use these same arguments? Exactly. The anti calcedonians use these arguments. They said, we have miracles. Look at us. We have miracle working people in our church. That means our position is true. And that's the exact same argument they use, the Roman Catholics use. They might say, okay, you beat me on doctrine, you beat me on ecclesiology, but look at Fatima. Do you have Fatima? You don't have Fatima. So that means that that Mary is going to come and, and she's going to fix the church. Same argument. Every heretic makes this cope argument. And Leontes responds with a very, very succinct statement. There is no necessary or absurd connection between being able to work miracles and being able to enunciate sound doctrine. Exactly. Remember the magician from Acts? He worked miracles. He tried to buy miracles, but he also worked his own miracles. Does that mean we should follow the magician in Acts? Of course not. Anyway, our people perform just as many miracles as they do, indeed more. Moreover, there may be many reasons why God gives the gift of miracle working which have nothing to do with one's doctrinal position. Exactly. So, this will conclude this video. Um, thank you all for watching. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I would recommend you check the previous parts, part 0, part 1, part 2, announcement, um, overview and the defense of Kalkadon and I will see you tomorrow if you're watching this on the day that is uploaded tomorrow part four we hopefully if nothing goes wrong with Jay Dyer we are going to steel man the Severin Christology and still never to let's bring it down so we're going to be doing a full-on absolute critique of Severin theology its implications and where it is wrong Thank you all for watching. See you guys in the next video. God bless you all. Have a great, great day.